said she was having an exciting You got two minutes and then we'll get started, okay? And if you if you didn't know yet, there are beverages available. There's ice in the white cooler on top of the table that you can put in a cup. And then the lower cooler on the floor actually has bottles of water, some ginger ale, kombucha, for anybody that drinks that fermented stuff. <laughs> so, and, uh, so there's a lot of things in there available. Some of the waters are frozen. It's to keep the rest of the things cold in the cooler. So just be aware if you, the bottle's solid, you might not want to grab that one. <laughs> or you'll be waiting a long time to get some trickling water out of it. So. You gonna sit up here maybe? Cheer me up? No, she's going to cheer me on. I'll uh, cheer both of you on. All right. Well, greetings everyone and welcome to all you fine poets and poetry lovers. Welcome to our Tucson Art Poetry Series or TAPS Poetry Reading Series. I'm David Navarro and I will be emceeing the event today. Um, TAPS debuted in February of 2023 and was organized by some Arizona poets because there was not enough venues for Arizona poets to read their published works. So every month, two Arizona poets now read at this beautiful location right here. And the schedule of readers is filled all the way to April of 2024. Wow. I'd like to extend you a greeting from Katie Sarazale. She is one of the co-founders of TAPS. And, um, and she is meeting today with the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. Um, she'll be there all weekend, actually. And so that's why I'm here emceeing, and so she wanted me to send you her greeting and welcome to this event. So, <clears throat> if you are an Arizona poet, a full or part-time resident, you can sign up to read your published works at this venue too. 
please copy the email address on the slide or contact Katie for information on signing up. Also on the back table, I put a little slip that has this logo, TAPS logo with Katie's uh, email on it. So if you're interested in signing up for a reading in the future, um, we're gonna just, this thing's gonna keep going. We can get signed up all the way into 2025, right? <laughs> Um, I'd like to recognize all the TAPS readers who are present here today. Um, please stand or wave and, and say your name and when you're going to read or when you did read. So were any TAPS readers here today? Past readers? Oh, no, no, no. Past. Future. In future? Okay, go ahead and say your name and when you're going to read. Uh, Lolly Butler. I'm going to read in February. February, okay. So you're all the way in 2024. And Lisa? Lisa Carrillo and Martin. I'm going to read in August. Reading in August. Okay. And um, reading next month, July 22nd, will be Eleanor Kidney and Geraldine Connolly. So a round of applause for all the TAPS readers. <laughs> TAPS is, a grant, is grant supported by the Arizona State Poetry Society. And we're thankful to ASPS for supporting us. Membership in ASPS is fantastic and opens many doors of opportunity for a poet. There's a list of benefits right on the slide here. Um, it gives you access to poetry events, group conferences, workshops, poetry circles, contests, readings, and more. The normal annual membership is a mere $25. Today, for all of you attendees, if you're not a member of ASPS, it'll be a $20 annual membership if you would like to join. The membership benefits are worth far more than $20. ASPS also has youth discounts available. So also, if you are in a financial hardship, ASPS will work with you to give you an annual membership at a reduced rate. So you can still contact them, um, ASPSPoetry.net. Attendance at a TAPS reading allows you to submit a poem to the ASPS annual contest under the category of TAPS. So please register your name on the sheet at the back of the table if you would like to have that opportunity. Come on in, there's lots of seats. All right, we're filling them up. There's a couple seats up here at some tables too if you're interested. And just to re-mention, the beverages are available on the back table. Um, I'd like to recognize some other groups as well. Um, well, first, let's uh, please consider a donation to the Tucson Desert Art Museum that also supports our TAPS readings and provides this beautiful auditorium for us to use. They put in a new mic for us last week. That's why you can hear us better if you were here if you were here the reading before, it wasn't so good. <laughs> but now we got a better mic, so that's great. And, um, and they keep this museum privately open just for us in our reading. Uh, in case you didn't know, it closed at 3, but it's open for our reading, and the double doors back there are open for using the restroom. <clears throat> so consider a donation. There's a box in the back of the room, and even just a couple dollars goes a long way toward helping them pay their bills and keeping this venue available for us. Now I'd like to recognize some other groups as well that are here in support of this event. The Sabino Poets, P-O-G, POG, Poetry in Action. Um, they do haiku and poetry hikes, and it's organized by Lisa Martin. And Lisa's sitting there, and how many POG poets are here today? Sabino, there we go, another one, a couple, okay, a couple. There we go. And then we have uh, Tucson Poets and Poetry is a new meetup group organized by Gabrielle Fundaro. She's over there. And how many of the Tucson Poets do we have here today? All right. There's a, there's, there's a few in the back I see, too. Don't be shy. Raise your hands. <laughs> and then the Tucson Poetry Writers Group is also another meetup group, and they're uh, in attendance in, in support as well. So. Thank you to all these groups. And, um, and I would also like to say that I have a group of friends and family out to support me, and my wife and daughter, and I have some friends over there, so all you guys can wave your hands. 
<laughs> and then we've got some more supporters here. Marilyn, Susie, Fran, Jean, Sandy, and Jim and Ginny are here to support Janet. And is there anybody else? <laughs> okay. So there we go. Everybody, everybody wave. All right. Everybody, big round of applause for all the supporters. Thank you very much for coming out and being part of this. We at TAX fully believe that you will enjoy yourself today. And if you like what you hear and you want to support the poets, you can purchase some of our books here today. Um, I will be actually giving away one of my books to every person who's attended today so you get a choice of one of my books. And I'll sign it for you if you want. You don't have to get it signed, but, uh, but if you'd like it signed, I'll sign it. And if you don't want my book, that's fine. <laughs> Not trying to force it on anyone. <laughs> And then Janet and I will also remain here to chat with you and answer questions and anything else that, that you may have that you'd like to share. Okay, so the restrooms, one last thing about restrooms, if you either go out the back door or the side door here and go to that brick walkway and you go straight that way, you'll see double doors leading to the back of the museum. Go in those double doors and then right down that hall is the restrooms. So. They're pretty easy to access. And then a second option is Poco and Moms. So, <laughs> so if, if that has to happen, then you know maybe we'll go to Poco and Moms, right? <laughs> All right. So our first reader today is Janet McMillan Rise. And Janet hails from New England, originally born in Hartford and raised in Storrs, Connecticut, home of the University of Northern Connecticut. Her parents introduced her to poetry at a young age. Janet's mom is from Tucson, and they moved here when she was a junior in high school. After her dad accepted a job at the University of Arizona, she had the awesome privilege of attending Robert Frost's reading when the University of Arizona Poetry Center was dedicated. So that was an incredible opportunity for her, especially being from New England. Robert Frost is called the New England poet, and this made her miss New England a lot more, but Arizona eventually won her heart. <laughs> After retiring as a professor of economics from the University of Northern Iowa, she began a more focused pursuit of poetry. Influenced by the work of James Hurst, and her early poems were published in a number of poetry journals. <coughs> She has two published chapbooks, Into the Sea of Green, Poems from the Prairie, which reflects her 41 years in Nebraska and Iowa, and Washed by a Summer Rain, Poems from the Desert, drawing on her years in Arizona and her Tucson family history. Her reading will mainly draw from these two books, these two chapbooks. So let's welcome Janet. I think I better stand so you can see. <laughs> and that's what I'm used to doing after 35 years of teaching. I can't imagine lecturing from a sitting position. <laughs> Thank you, David, for your introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, when I first learned about David, uh, I looked him up on the internet, and I realized that we have two things in common. We're both from New England, and we both love Robert Frost. So I'm going to start today with the only poem that I still can say by heart. It's a Robert Frost poem. Nature's first green is gold, her heart is dew to hold, her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. That's for you, Robert Aww. Frost. And if, if it sounded familiar, you don't need to applaud. You can save that for the end. Um, <laughs> if that sounded familiar, it might be that you either read or had children who read a book called The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton, and that poem is in that book. And I only know that because my niece read that book, and when I recited this poem, she said, oh, I know that poem. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with a poem not from um, either of my books, which are 
up there this is a this is a poem that was recently published in creosote a journal of poetry and prose and it comes out of eastern arizona college and i'm mentioning it some of you might want to submit some poems there i was pleased to have this published uh, this year recently how we go on we sit among cacti lobelia butterflies on milkweed shaded by a tall sycamore where an Anna's hummingbird has built her nest of woven twigs, spider silk, plant down. The lanky frame of my friend's late husband ambles toward the shaded bench in the corner of her backyard, his life captured in a row of Tattersall shirt collars hung between two trees. My sister's voice, gone for a decade, echoes from a blue chair where I see her be decked in filigree jewelry nestled in a woven shawl. My friend and I laugh as we remember favorite childhood games, Jack's Double Dutch, and mother's lessons on how to peel a hard-cooked egg, fold a towel in thirds, clean a coffee pot. We sip iced sun tea and plot a coming trip. Around us, past, present, future, weave a sacred web. I'm going to read two poems from my first chapbook that was published in, in uh, 2020. I call it my pandemic chapbook. <laughs> published in 2020, but I couldn't do any readings after it came out, so I'm, I'm, I'm behind. Um, it is titled Into the Sea of Green Poems from the Prairie, and as David said, it is based on my 41 years living in Nebraska and Iowa. When I lived, I moved from Nebraska to Iowa and I taught at the University of Northern Iowa and had a friend who taught in Ames, which was at the time about a two hour drive. And I would go there frequently on weekends, especially in the fall to football games. And I never took the interstate. I could have taken I-35, but that wasn't for me. So I found back roads. And this is a poem that came to me on one of those drives on the back roads called In the World. On D35 in Hardin County, about midway between the two places where I know people, a tractor approaches from the north, driven by, a, driven by a boy of about 13. I feel a kinship of space and time with this young man I've never met. We share the sky in the canvas my windshield frames and the roadside ditches left unmowed for the pheasants. We own the fields in greens and tans and other greens again. His the ownership by deed, if he should choose in years to come. Mine the momentary possession by eyes and heart in passing. We're in the world together, my young farmer friend and I, sharing the split second of being on a county blacktop somewhere. <coughs> That's reason enough for a wave, I think. So does he. <laughs> Uh, when I was living in Nebraska or in Iowa year-round, um, I got used to the seasons. And uh, one time, one day, I read an article in the Des Moines Register that was about something kind of out of place and a little bit out of season. Little did I know that the bird that was discussed in this article would become my favorite bird once I moved to Tucson. <coughs> and I asked some indulgence from my friend Susie, the Spanish teacher, for something I'll say in this poem. I hope correctly. Our little coal of fire. A cinnabar crystal hides in pine, a cardinal perhaps. But no, this bird is a glowing ember, a vermilion flycatcher, who's wandered from the desert to thrill us with his brilliance. It's as if we survived the cold, wet summer for this day alone, for the long lost southwest wind bending corn still in the fields carrying Indian summer and our bird on his trip north. It seems we've waited months for this one moment of beauty beyond our everyday expectations, beyond the russet glow of a hawk's tail, the burnished orange of a robin's breast. This single spark of scarlet, our bracita de fuego, calls to us, pita wheat, pita wheat, and sends us off on our annual journey through days of gray and beige.
So the remaining uh, poems that I'm going to read are from the new book that just came out uh, in April. And this, is, uh, this book is called Washed by Summer Rain, Poems from the Desert. I'm not going to move again, so I don't know what the next book will be. <laughs> I think I have to go back in time because I'm, I'm here in the desert to stay. Um, this book is dedicated to my maternal grandmother, my cousin Jim's maternal grandmother. And um, her name was Sally Littlefield. She moved to Tucson at age 10 in 1902 and lived downtown, what we would call downtown. I'm not sure exactly where, but when she was married in 1913, she and my grandfather built a house at 707 North Euclid Avenue. And um, I often say my Tucson roots are deep, but they're not really mine. They're, they're my family's. Um, uh, my mother lived in that same house from the day she was born till the day she got married, 22 years later. And two years after graduation from the U of A, she moved away and then she moved back. And um, two footnotes for this poem. Uh, my family lived in my grandmother's house during the winter when I was in second grade and my dad was on a sabbatical. And uh, the other footnote is that I was inspired to write this poem, and I'm looking at Jennifer, uh, in a workshop with Marge Pellegrino. So you tell her I read this poem that was based on, there's an epigraph for my poem, and it, the epigraph is after Dolores Gonzalez, squad dress circa 1940. Dolores Gonzalez was a seamstress in Tucson who was in the 1940s and 50s, uh, was famous for her squad dresses. Squad dress. My own squad dress was not so elaborate. If there was a concha belt, it was nothing like the one you display. Tooled leather, intricate silver, inlaid turquoise. Memory is hazy, but I can picture fabric one degree toward green from the brilliant azure sky. Enveloped in accordion pleats, I take grandma's hand as she shows me off at the rodeo parade. I feel lost. I squeeze tight. I am seven. <laughs> I'm going to celebrate Eric Tucson by having a drink of water. <laughs> I live in Oro Valley, uh, not, too far, not too far from Honeybee Canyon. And this is where the Hohokam people lived between, I have to look at my notes, between 600 and 1,000 years ago. And uh, they lived between the Tucson Mountains and the Tortolitas. And I live between those two. Uh, I think of them often, and sometimes I write poems about them, and this is one of those. The Owl at Honeybee Canyon. Here's how you can find him. Follow the trail down the hill, then turn north under the road. Walk up the wash a mile or so till you come to the ruins of the dam. Keep going. On your left, you will see figures, animals, symbols etched into the flat-faced rock. There he is, the Hohokam Owl, helper to the guardian of the valley. What you will feel when you see him, I cannot say. But maybe, as I have, you will sense the presence of people from a thousand years ago. Brothers and sisters laying their heads down, tonight in the same place we will rest ours. Maybe you will hear the great horned owl, friend in the dark, hoot his promise to protect us under this black sky lit by a million stars. My next poem is not Arizona, it's New Mexico, and it uh, uh, came out of a trip, I, I took a, a number of trips to Taos in the, in the uh, 1990s, and um, this one was prompted by a, a phrase I stole from a sermon one Sunday. <laughs> I won't tell you which line it is, you can guess. <laughs> Taos, picture yourself sitting on a rock with the wall of the mission looming behind you, guarding you like some lost soul. Hear the echoes of an early mass, voices of 12 elders chanting low as they enter, now louder as they move in step along the aisle. Feel your eyes close against the sting of a late winter morning, then open slowly to the light rising in the massive sky. Feel the high sun illuminate your senses. Imagine standing shoulder deep in red willows on the banks of a stream that runs so swift and clear, it sweeps you back 900 years 
and reflects even then these same ladders raised against these same adobe walls. In your ache for a new tomorrow, put yourself here. Keep fresh these images of yesterday, of all the yesterdays that show how what is old survives and how you, restored by the spirit of this timeless place, can move on to the next today. Uh, in February, pre, this was pre-COVID, in February of 2019, I went with uh, members of my church, the Mountain Shadows Presbyterian Church in Catalina, uh, on a mission trip to Douglas, Arizona and Agua Prieta. We helped support a coffee cooperative called Cafe Justo. Susie, how do I say it? Justo. <laughs> and um, I was, the trip really made an impression on me. And a footnote here, I lived in Tucson during part of high school and college, and there's some references to that. Sides. On one side, rusted steel slats covered with razor wire, curled snake-like, border patrol cars parked randomly, cameras with a three-mile range. All of this says stay in, stay out. The same slats, other side, adorned with vibrant murals, convey an eager welcome. In the 50s and 60s, we'd go to Nogales for lunch at Zula's, then wander to the Me Mexico side to buy bakery goods, tinware, vanilla, blue glass. In college, we'd cross to drink zombies at La Caverna. <laughs> that searing afternoon in May 1968, we locked arms to celebrate Border Beauty and Friendship Day in Douglas, Agua Prieta. Mm. Today we share a lunch of pork, frijoles, lemonade, buy bags of beans at Cafe Justo. Together we walk the divide side by side, our mixed language echoing off a backdrop of orange paint with gray swirls, butterflies, two hands touching, the art of harmony. I uh, enjoy gardening, not so much this time of year, but I enjoy gardening in my little backyard in, in uh, Oro Valley. And this is a story of something that happened there. Uh, there's an epigraph, it's from Henry David Thoreau's journal, and the epigraph is, the quail invisible whistles, and who attends? Gamble, I attend. I attend every day, three times a, a day watching the mother, or is it the father, hiding under red geraniums, warming the clutch. When either parent is present, I say, hello, how are you? <laughs> when they are absent, I water the pot, careful not to let 11 spotted eggs float away. <laughs> On Wednesday morning, a week before their mother's wake up call, seven days from hatching in synchrony, I find their nest destroyed. <laughs> My yard is lifeless. No sign of the quail paired for life. I want to find them, tell them I'm sorry. Those were my children too. That's a downer, so here's a, <laughs> here's a little bit of garden humor. I used to try to be really crea creative and plant a garden that maybe was all petunias, different colors, all white flowers, different kinds. And um, so this was my attempt at a red garden. The Red Garden. Notice I said attempt. The Red Garden. My Red Garden. Every pot in place. Ron's glaze holding yucca, blood red. Pale blue pottery with one scarlet geranium, three petunias, carmine. Large blue pot featuring crimson pentas, a flower new to me, and one hibiscus, bold red. The first bud, barely visible, takes on a strange shade of amber, then evolves into blaze orange. But the tag said red hibiscus. <laughs> Days pass, I fret, the bud swells, till finally this morning, I'm greeted by a fantastic six inch bloom, a burst of, oh no, mango. <laughs> <laughs> this will be my last one. And this poem is um, the poem from which I took the title of the book, Washed by Summer Rain. I mentioned that my mother was a Tucson native, famous she thought for never having to walk more than three blocks to school from, kid from kindergarten through college. 
she stayed in Tucson until she was 22 and then came back when she was 45 and stayed for the rest of her life. And um, this is, starts out with a reference to her. It's called Washed. My mother, in her decades away from the desert, must have longed for this creosote smell, for a rain cooling a summer day, dust washed down to earth, clouds shrouding giant mountains, lungs filled with clarified air. I set the watering can by the patio, stand at the window and watch it fill. Summer rains, male rains as Native Americans say, mount in violence, presaged by distant rumbles, flashes of light. After four straight days over 105, moments when I could not place a finger on the steering wheel, when a morning walk was at 5.30 or not at all, I now delight in this cool afternoon dampness, aware that no shade tree, no jug of ice water, could rival the relief this monsoon brings to birds, animals, reptiles, to all of us washed down by a summer rain. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce David Navarro. David is an author, poet, essayist, and haikuist. Did I say that right? Haikuist. First published in the 1980 winter issue of the Purdue Exponent Literary Edition. His poetry has appeared in numerous magazines and venues over the years, including 16 anthologies and, get this, seven of his own poetry collections. He's conducted local and online poetry and writing workshops, including the Tuscaloosa, Alabama Public Library Poetry Boot Camps. His online writing, publishing, and poetry groups have over 11,000 members. David currently works as an academic medical writer and editor, working with scientists to streamline their clinical, clinical trial studies and reports. He's a biblical research scholar, poet, and writer, and a minister of a local congregation in Tucson, Arizona. He also serves as secretary to both the Arizona Poetry Society and the Tucson branch, uh, the Tucson Poetry Society. He holds an arts and humanities degree in interdisciplinary studies from Purdue and degrees in communications and theology with other institutions. And I want to just mention, and I think all four of them are there, um, I want to mention four of David's books. A book of haiku uh, titled A Tree Frog's Eyes, published in 2020. <laughs> Another 2020 uh, book, this poetry, In the Praise of His Glory. And uh, a book of haibun, and I hope you'll talk about that when you present. I want to know more. Archway to Beyond. And finally, in uh, 2016, a book of poetry, I love this title, Dropping Ants into Poems. <laughs> and my pleasure is to pre present David Navarro. Thank you. I'm going to quickly do some reset up here, make this a little easier. <clears throat> I think I also will. Uh, I don't want to step on these. Oh. I don't know where those came from. Those might be mine. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to, I'm going to be using some slides here, and uh, so I wanted to reset this, and I might need this just a little higher, but I'm not too much taller. <laughs> <laughs> so I also have had to make sure I stand up to be seen at times. <laughs> well, um, part of understanding and appreciating a poem is to know a little bit about the poet. We are each the sum and substance of all that we have learned and experienced in this life. And this includes our natural genetics as well as mixing with our environment and interactions with it. Our selection and rejection of all that we have learned. So who we are is we are because, yeah, okay, I can talk. We are who we are because of what we believe about ourselves. The expression of self comes from this background of who we are. Poetry is an expression out of the poet's life and experience. It is not a communication. It is simply a poet's expression in words of self and experience. 
However, when a poem is read or heard by someone, it becomes a communication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was kind of keeping that back a little there. But so in other words, we express ourselves in poetry, the poet, some people may never even read certain poems we write. Mm -hmm. But when a poem is read or heard, then it becomes a communication. And it's the highest form of communication in words because a poem is more than just the meaning of the words strung together in a linear fashion. By use of figures of speech, poetic technique, charged language, a poem becomes more than just the words in it. Not only does it communicate to the mind, but it conveys to the heart as well. It impresses consciously and subconsciously. Poetry is also a catalyst of self-discovery for the reader and listener. When we engage a poem as a reader, we engage it with who we are, our experiences, both similar and different from the poets. And we often add to the poem what it says to us. Engaging a poem is an interactive process. So it's my believing today that I can convey a little bit of myself through my poems to you in a way that is enjoyable and engaging and which will act as a mirror for some of your own self-discovery and what they say to you. I'm going to be very candid and honest in my presentation of my reality. It's not intended to offend in any way, um, but it's just the facts. <laughs> I was born in Newport, Rhode Island, and I was the offspring of a one-night stand with a first-generation Italian immigrant listed as unknown on my birth certificate. My mom was a first-generation Portuguese immigrant from the Azores. My older brother came from my mom's first marriage to an American of English descent. My older sister is an adopted Korean war orphan, guessed to be about 18 months old when she was found. Then my Latino dad, who raised us all, was a first-generation Mexican immigrant who had a son with my mom, so my younger brother is of Mexican descent. <laughs> my family growing up consisted of three half-brothers of English, Italian, and Mexican descent, and a sister who is Korean, all being raised by a Mexican father. <laughs> Talk about an all-American melting pot family. <laughs> we were definitely all-American, too. So we started out in poverty in inner-city Chicago. And at 10 years old, we moved to rural Crown Point, which was a very European-descended community. And there we experienced some racial prejudice and bullying. But there were also few who were good friends and good supporters. My love of nature and words is reflected in my poetry. I attended Purdue University to study English and literature. Then I spent 10 years in the US Air Force serving in three conflicts, including the first Gulf War. I left the military to go into the ministry leadership program, and I earned a theology degree, and I've been serving in the ministry for 38 years now. I've had a lot of jobs and lived in 29 different villages, towns, and cities in 14 states and the country of England. So I'm pretty much a transient, but I came here to Arizona to stay. <laughs> I said, I'm getting up there in years. It's time to pick a place. <laughs> so, and I love that they had the poetry center here in Tucson, so that was a big draw for me. <laughs> I left the military, uh, as I already told you that. I've had all those different jobs. My main career has been in technical writing and now in medical writing. However, my real love has always been in poetry and fiction writing. So let me get to this slide here. Um, I'm going to read some poems from these various books that are shown right here. And, uh, and the first one is going to come from um, a collection of poetry that's actually being released in July. And it's called Cracks in the Ice, due out in July. So, um, so I want to show you this picture. You can see that picture really good. That picture is the red pirogue by Diane Parks. And uh, there's a little bit of um, information there on the poem, in case you need to, to know what a pirogue is, and a griro, and, and a sazerac. So that's going to be in these poems here. And it's coming from a book called Cracks in the Ice. And it's a new book that's coming out. So 
This is a very hybrid poem, an, an experimental poem, because it combines um, imagism, an imagist poem, with brevity poem, and then there's a haiku in the middle. And a haibun, which Janet mentioned earlier, is actually prose written with a haiku in the middle of the prose or at the end of the prose. And it's a very common Japanese form. But there's a lot of experimental forms of haibun, which include writing a poem and then putting a haiku in it and other things. So that's what this one comes from. And this is an ekphrastic poem because it's based on this piece of art here. And an ekphrastic poem should describe the piece of art, but then also add a story and some action and information into it. So the red pirogue, and you may pick up on some uh, uh, allusions here to some other poets. The red pirogue, so much revolves around an elongated red pirogue, bobbing in the dank swamp to a cacophony of birds. We chat long on my bayou cabin porch, tossing rocks at the bony-plated alligators who don't even bat an eye when one hits. Most miss, and the frogs just keep croaking in deep-throated metronomic tones, no matter the insistence of the interruptions. Pink swamp orchids, a rock arches, arches through the air, plunging into water. With a resounding crack, one hits the wooden boat, the avian amphibian orchestra of piccolos and guttural guiros continues unfazed under the stalwart gaze of the gawking gators. And even we persist talking into the damp bayou night, sipping absinthe sazeracs under the full pink moon. So that was that one. And then uh, the next one is from glacier to shining sea. This one, this is one that's a, a little bit honest here about my background. So um, it's an in interesting poem and uh, if, pardon the words in it. They're, it's not <laughs> horrible cuss words, but, it's, <laughs> but just so you know ahead of time. From glacier to shining sea. I am a river and I flow in wild courses from glacial deposits up in old Mount Tahoma, down steep ravines, through carved canyons, over rubble, and into western cedar copses. I am an American bastard with a Portuguese mother and unknown Italian father. My older brother came from her first marriage to English Esquire out of the Tower of London Beef Eaters. My sister is a Korean war orphan, found starving and eating bugs at 18 months old in a war-torn field where her parents' corpses lay vacant, staring into space, never to see their daughter again. A Latino man swooped in and took up our Portuguese, English, Korean, Italian bastard family, <laughs> adding his own Mexican boy. Dad lifted us out of poverty into American bourgeoisie, grade makers, and fierce competitors with the Joneses. Alakine was my boyhood hero, teaching me his famous chess defense, which I used against the haters who called us gooks, bicks, bastards, wetbacks, and PRs. I frothed and foamed, splashing over all the boulders and rocks. I won and they hated me. No way could the bastard be a chess champ. I won at baseball, Boy Scouts, war games, and academics. Their hatred didn't matter because I surged over the rubble and moved on. Ten years I served in the Air Force as a combat communicator and war planner in multiple conflicts, none as severe as my own upbringing. I settled, grew a bit broader, and flowed deeper. Thirty years in my own family later, I still gush through valleys. I have overflowed my banks and gathered all as I roll, sucking in streams, creeks, rivulets, and channels from marshes. Nothing stops me and nothing ever will. For I have the grandest of estuaries to build, and that still lies ahead. To that end, I write paragraphs, poems, essays, and stories, words that whirl in eddies, the suspended fine granules that will fill the delta with rich loam as I pour forth into the shining sea. So that, that's going to be in cracks in the ice. 
And, uh, and then this one's later on. So let's go to the next one. And this is going to come from my book, Dare to Soar. This was my very first published collection. And, uh, and there's going to be a few of them that I read from this book. Um, the first one, uh, I'd like to share a little bit of an incident with you. Uh, as you know, we, in the inner city, we were poor at first. So my school was also you know, pretty, pretty rugged school there. And our playground at recess was the front street in front of the school, blocked off at both ends. And then across the street was an fa abandoned factory. And the abandoned factory parking lot was our extended um, playground, our recess playground. And it had all these toxic piles of waste all around it. It had slag from the steel mills piled in the alley. The alleyways, many times, they just dumped all the slag from the steel mills in the alleyways. And there was tons of broken and shattered glass all over this um, abandoned parking lot. And we used to run around and play. Well, one day, I tripped, and I went flying in the air, and I fell, and I landed right on the heel of this hand to keep me from hitting my face. And a piece of glass went right into the hand. And when I got home, my dad performed the surgery <laughs> because he couldn't afford to pay a hospital performance, so he did it. And he did a pretty good job, but took a couple people to sit on me and hold me down. And, uh, and I still have the scar, and I have the little mark in it, but, um, but this is They Were Me, and, um, and I have to uh, get to it here because... I didn't mark some of these in my uh, book here, but they were me. In the glass shards, I see the city children throwing balls against the very bricks where bottles shattered dreams in the playground there, where asphalt meets chain link fenced insanity. In vanity, they were me. Busy cars zipped obliviously by, bounding away, around, about, and gone. Cement bluffs lined our valley of slag and gems. An abandoned parking lot down beneath the street, the playing field of our dreams and aspirations. Speckled with sharp, indiscriminate shards, calling for careless hands and knees, disrupting another perfect day running with a bloody palm and wailing eyes. In the glass shards, the city children gather to lament their stricken fellow there where the ball bounces beyond broken glass reveries into the street of mindless cars and gone. Like a dream that never happened, but I have the scar to prove it, and I know they were me. So that's they were me. And, uh, and then, of course, growing up in the city, there was uh, a park across the street from where I grew up and it was across the railroad tracks. The freight train came right through. Believe it or not, the freight train was 300 feet from my house. Mm -hmm. And when they used to, you know, there was no codes back then when they built the city. And I mean, this thing, there was no fence around it. It was just right there in the alley behind the houses across the street from our house. And then across from the tr tracks was the park. And the park was a pretty big park. It was called Calumet Park, and it went all the way to the Lake Michigan beachfront. And so um, west of me was city, metal, oil refineries, toxic waste, airports, you know, all that stuff. But east was the park. And so after school, I pretty much grew up in the park because I developed a great love for nature to escape the city. But this poem's called Man in Metal. Hear the steel and feel the screeching wail of grinders on the lakefront of industrial power, penetrated by a long, low drone foghorn tug, sloshing its way through the fidgety waves, a barge of ore, coke, slag in tow sunk low in the water, flirting with the idea of being sucked under, while smoke billows from stacks, 
and turning and roiling pillows, smelted gases, phosphates, acids, refineries of might and power, fabricating for man, woman, and child, and nation, goods and stuff, the pride of life, fuels, solvents, chemicals, synthetics for sustenance, manufactured thrills for craving egos, and wondrous pills to mask the ills, imported, exported, transported, through skies and seas, in the bellies of planes and ships, and carried forth on the backs of rails and roads to a hungry and wanting people. So that's man in metal. And then, of course, I noted that I, we moved to Crown Point, Indiana, which was a rural setting, and I call it the woods and wilds because where we moved was actually outside the city, and there was un developed and uncharted woods and wilds all out there. And so I found myself living from dawn to dusk out in the woods. <laughs> and, and there was this favorite pond of mine, which I used to hang out by in lots of different swamps and things out there. And I call this the Forge of Solitude. The rustic life, pastoral scenes, the basis of idyllic dreams. The simple ways of nature come, its harmony in total sum. These country settings, warm and real, incredible to smell and feel. Rural field to wood and wild, God's green earth and nature's child. Pioneer, explore and wonder, sunny day or storm and thunder. Rivers, streams, dank swamps and ponds, the forges of these lifelong bonds. In thicket, I would sit to ponder, by the pond, just over yonder. Watch the teeming life abound, and frogs and flies go round and round. Frost and Poe, my favorite reading, Emerson, Thoreau, all pleading, calling me to solitude in this idyllic interlude. So this next one, I have to read because I just have to. <laughs> and the reason I have to is because it's my wife's favorite poem that I've ever written. And, uh, and the funny thing is, is she had no idea that I was going to be reading it here today. And while we were setting up, she said to me, you should read Red Dragon. <laughs> so as soon as I find that, Normally, I would put little markers in my books here and everything, but apparently I was so busy setting up and doing other things that I forgot to do that. <laughs> so, now I have to find out what page it's on. There we go, 72. All right, this is called Red Dragon. It's a little bit of a childhood memory poem here, and it has a unique rhyme scheme to it, and it's a lot of fun. So. Um, and I think I can project well, because I might move around a little bit here, so if, if you lose the mic on me a little bit. When mother sent me out to play just in the garden there, I saw a flower in the bed. Oh, let me move ahead here to, there we go. I want you to see that image of the red dragon in the rose there. <laughs> so here we go. When mother sent me out to play just in the garden there, I saw a flower in the bed, a crimson rose of deepest red. I drew my sword, beware. Imagine now red dragon's glare, his eyes some fire hot. With thorny spikes on tail and back, or poison breath he could attack. But would he get first shot? He sprayed his poison cloud of rot. The vapor took my sight. I staggered now in darkness thrust. My magic blade I had to trust. I swung with all my might. Red dragon rasped, you silly knight, I'll do you in this day. I dropped and rolled and felt the sting. His tail thorns caught me lingering. I bled right where I lay. I had to make red dragon pay for the terror he had wrought, a menace to my neighborhood, this nemesis of childhood. I'd make him come to naught. I feigned my fading as we fought. His pride and ego swelled. When he drew nigh to watch me die, then through his neck my sword did fly, red dragon I had felled. The queen rushed out and screamed and yelled, 
You lopped my precious rose. She took the stick out of my hand and banished me from garden land. That's how the story goes. So if you're ever sent to play in garden land, my friend, beware red dragons lurking there. But even more, you must beware Queen Mother in the end. <laughs> so this next one comes from the very first chat book that I um, published, which is out of print. So I have my old copy here. It's called Such Are the Poems. And I think this one demonstrates a lot my love of language um, and the poetry of, of uh, the tradi traditional poetry of the past. It's called Such Are the Poems. I like the poems of yesteryear, the poems of twas and yon and air, the poem whose old archaic tongue was in its prime and lo, ere young. Their tales were spun of days of yore in silhouettes and shadows more, of wondrous things and myths of fame plucked from a fair and dainty dame. She softly sang the chorus sweet and gathered sparrows at her feet, and oh, she sang it o'er and o'er to us who then this poem's for. Whate'er betide, I then must say, I like to let her have her way, to lure me to that time beyond, inside the poems of which I'm fond. I then embrace her bosom dear, and hold her close and tender near, as I recite with her the rhyme that thither too I pulled from time, and lay my head upon her breast to find some solace and some rest. Such are the poems of yesteryear, the poems of twas and yon and air. <laughs> So that's a fun one of past language. I had to figure out an excuse for using archaic language in a poem. So, <laughs> so I said, hey, I'll just write a poem about archaic language. <laughs> so that's where that one came from. And then uh, this, where is it? This quirky book called Dropping Ants into Poems. So. You might wonder where that title comes from. Many of you may be familiar with Billy Collins' poem where he talks about dropping a mouse into a poem and watching it find its way out. So in this book, I have a poem which says, why drop a mouse into a poem when you can drop ants into poems? <laughs> so that's where the title came from. But um, first, I'd like to read a piece of flash. It's not fiction, but it's a flash story um, and it kind of sets the tone for the book. And my mom, she was a very uh, inventive, innovative, and creative person, very artistic. And I probably got a lot of uh, genes from her. But uh, she was my biggest fan growing up when most people thought I was a crazy nutcase and that I was hopeless. She was always supporting me in my writing and everything I did. So now today, I'm still a crazy nutcase and hopeless, but I'm one who can write poetry. <laughs> so here we go. School. Mrs. Navarro, we are calling to inform you that your son skipped class and we caught him. Mom, really? Where did you catch him? School. In the library. Mom, in the library? What was he doing? School. Reading, studying books, writing notes. Mom, and that's a bad thing? School, he should have been in class learning about prepositional phrases. He said he knew all that stuff and needed to explore the timeless lore. He mumbled about colonial expansion, World War II, a divided Europe and a new century to come. Said he needed to launch an insect investigation into the words to find out the Neospora that needs to be sown. Mom, Neospora? Did you ask him what that is? School. Well, he said that it was all about seminal preponderance, the weight of highly original pace setting and life changing ideas, and their impact on his future and the future of mankind. Mrs. Navarro, we're sorry to say, but we think your son needs some psychological counseling. <laughs> Mom, no, he just needs to write a book of poetry. <laughs> so this is a, a, a quirky book, and um, there's the cover there. And the one poem I'm going to read from this book is uh, from, you can see the prehistoric picture there of the, uh, 
mammoths and stuff, and the buildings in the back is downtown LA. And I don't know if you've ever been there or not, it's called the La Brea Tar Pits, and it is right smack dab in the center of downtown LA. And, um, and of course, it's a scientific area, and it's cordoned off from the rest of the city, and it's a museum, and you can pay, and you can go there and see it. But this is called Warning, Semi-Automated Redeconstruction Ahead. How crazy is it that thick black bitumen bubbles up in the middle of downtown LA? Natural raw asphalt, goo pits from the depths of the earth, full of piles of dinosaur bones, the stench of a street crew at work, someday to consume perhaps the bones of buildings, skyscrapers sinking into the pits of liquid roads. <laughs> So there's a lot more. This, the whole book, it, it's 28 poems, and then there's 18 uh, haiku or zen poems in here. And they're all thematically connected. So it's, it's really, I mean, the, the whole book has to be taken as a book to really understand all the individual poems in it. And there's a theme that goes through the whole thing in that little flash story I read you at the beginning has all those words in it, insect investigation and neospora and things like that. So it, it's kind of an interesting and quirky book there, but, um, but I like it. Why wouldn't I? Because I wrote it. <laughs> all right, so um, now I'd like to backtrack a little here and share about something else, uh, a passion for haiku. At 19 years old, I was homeless and invited to sleep on my aunt's dining room floor which was better than my car. So during that time, I discovered haiku in a book called Zen Poems of China and Japan. Haiku are very often deep contemplative poems, so it is hard to do a reading of haiku. You have to really have time to sit and ponder the implied connections. Nonetheless, here's a selection of a few haiku from, the, from my book, A Tree Frog's Eyes. And there's the Tree Frog's Eyes book. Those are Japanese symbols for haiku, and then I put those on the screen so you can see them better. And I will read them, and you can ponder them. Just one summer night, the desert queen comes out. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Evening talk, after the long day sun, hot air blows. <laughs> Strange winter guest, don't bother me, fly, and you can stay. I don't know if you've ever had a fly come awake in the middle of winter. You know, usually they go dormant, and, but every once in a while in the middle of winter, it's December, almost Christmas time, and you see this sluggish fly flying around. <laughs> kind of woke up a little early, right? So I was like, just don't bother me, and you can stay. <laughs> Swollen streams, yesterday's icicles, tomorrow's flowers. A tree arrives at the festival of blossoms, right on time. That one's interesting because when I lived in uh, Washington, I went to Point Defiance Park, which is a really huge botanical garden and park, and they have flowers that bloom all year long. They've planned it so that it hits the different seasons. And there was the spring season came and everybody was like, come on out, you know, come see this. So I went there and it was very enjoyable, but I noticed a circle of trees that had no flowers on them. And I was like, well, what are these trees? What's going on here? They didn't bloom. They weren't, they weren't on time. So that was in the back of my mind when I thought, you know, you, you plan a festival of blossoms and you go there. I wonder if the tree got the memo. <laughs> Snowflakes, and no two ever alike, we watch together. Hmm. Whack, a June bug stops between my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> see the wind, the crackling of leaves blows by. You know you don't see the wind, actually, but you can see the manifestation of it, and in this case, the crackling of leaves. And it says a lot about our lives, too. Um, you don't always see what's behind what's on the surface, what's manifested in life, but there's something there motivating it. 
Through the garden, a stone path meanders, yet it does not move. <laughs> this one, I think about the continuum of time and space. Don't ask me how I make that connection. <laughs> Smooth stones flow down the river in a barge. So one of the things that haiku can do at times is they call it a semantic just disjunction, where when you initially start reading it, you, you get a mind picture of something, and then the last line is like, oh, okay, now I... So I've, obviously stones don't float on a river. So when you first start reading this, you might be thinking, how are stones floating on a river? In a barge. Cemetery crow in a bare black oak, dead silence. <laughs> This long journey, a child still behind wrinkled eyes. <coughs> so that one's a little bit about. All right, so can somebody explain this math formula to me? <laughs> in, uh, in this book, this is the way Waukee in it. Um, this is uh, biblical poetry and some biblical studies. And, uh, and I have a poem in here called Math Falls Short. And in this poem, it's interesting, um, the postulation that I set forth here, I was thinking one day, which can be dangerous, I made sure I didn't burn the house down. Um, I was thinking one day, and I came up with this idea, and I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. So here you go, see what you think. Math falls short. Love cannot be measured in a test tube, because real life is not two plus two, nor 50 times 50 for that matter. When it all rounds out, there are no corners. Mm -hmm. Outside of the box, the nine dots disappear. Mm -hmm. And we discover that free will is a glitch in the universe, an anomaly in the arithmetic of all time. That is why it is logical that God must be, for math falls short of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> so that one's in, this is the way Waki in it. And then this book, In the Praise of His Glory, um, this came out just before the pandemic. And I also had a little bit of the same dilemma that Janet had. When I moved here to Tucson, I'm like all excited. Hey, Poetry Center, lots of poetry venues. I did research. I looked up cafes where people met and did readings. And I got here in the pandemic hit. I was like, confined at home. <laughs> oh, well. Such is life, right? <laughs> so this poem is called Still, and it's just um, a memory of sitting in a windowsill um, in the evening when the sun was going down. So it's called Still. In the coolness of the eve, strikes the bell to mark the time, strikes the chord within my heart, strikes the wonder of my mind. In the coolness of the eve, as the wind will wander by, as the trees will sway to show it, I'll be gazing on the sky. In the coolness of the eve sets the sun across the land, sets the greatness of the moment, and I see God's mighty hand. In the coolness of the eve from my open window sill, in his word I meditate, and with joy my heart is filled. So that's that one. And this is a new anthology called Nature Knows the Way. Um, it's not my anthology, you know, my collection of poetry, but my poem, Yonder Pond, was published in it. And you may be familiar with, um, with one of the lines in here because I read it in a different poem, but it became the subject of its own poem. Um, there was a contest to emulate the work of Henry David Thoreau. And I read a bunch of his poetry, and he's a simple rhyming poet. And of course, he loved nature and ponds. And I said, well, gee, I have a good connection to that. <laughs> so I entered the contest, and I did pretty well in it. I think I was ninth place. And um, out of like 800 entries, so, you know, I was bummed out that I didn't get a winning poem. But hey, you know, that's not too bad of a place to be. Anyway, it also got selected for publication in this book. And this is called Yonder Pond. And remember, this is in, uh, in tribute to Henry David Thoreau. At yonder pond, I ponder on the frog's engaging stare. As flies go round and round and then, a fish jumps in the air. 
Profuse the sweat runs down my face under the sopping sky. And Saul sees on throughout the day for man and dragonfly. To energize all life on earth precisely every day, the cosmic cycle ticking on, endless minutiae. Frogs and flies and fish abound, and I appreciate at yonder pond I ponder on until it's very late. <laughs> and the final poem here is All My Own. And uh, this was the last one from Cracks in the Ice. Uh, which will be published in July, and it's called All My Own. And this one comes out of, when I was young, my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. In fact, he wanted me to be a lawyer so bad that he actually used connections, and he got me a full scholarship to Notre Dame University. And I was supposed to go to Notre Dame University. So imagine his dismay when I said, uh, Dad, I'm going to Purdue and I'm going to study English and literature. <laughs> yeah, things weren't too uh, well in the household there for a little while. <laughs> but I've always been a person that wanted to forge my own way. And, you know, the world presents to us this opportunity and go in this path and go do this. So I chose my own path, and that's what all my own is all about. And this is actually a Frost tribute because it's inspired by his poem, The Road Not Taken. And uh, here you go, all my own. On a well-worn road, I was pushed along to reach the destination I was shown. I never really liked how it was paved and where it led was not where I would go. In time, I came to where the road diverged and had to choose the route that I would take. I stood there in the crossroads unimpressed for every road was paved and manicured. Take a road that's safe, they all said, pointing, <laughs> as if they were the guides of every truth. And my success depended on their plans, so I could reach the mountaintop at last. But fed up with the courses they had made, I turned and headed for the gnarly wood and chose a route none others ever had and forged a fresh new path all on my own. So that's it. Thank you very much. And just to let you know that um, Janet and I are going to stay here to chat with you and answer questions. She's going to set up her books on this side of the table. I'm going to set up my books over there, and we'll each be up here. And you can see some of our books displayed over there. And like I said to you, and each of you are welcome to choose one of my books as a free book for your own copy. It's a book giveaway. So I'll have them all sitting here, and you can choose whichever one you like. And you can use the restroom real quick, get some beverages as we set up the table here with our books. So thanks again for your attention. Sure appreciate it. Right here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. 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 Th